Crayfish are just they're just a wonderful story. I mean, it starts in an aquarium in Germany. So you can tell this is going to be weird. Um, yeah. These enthusiasts for aquaria in uh, in Germany and amongst their collections, you know, some of them have a crayfish. And um, this is a recognized crayfish. You know, it's been imported actually from the United States, from Miami, I think, that kind of area. And um, they pop it in their aquarium. And, you know, it's just one crayfish. And it has offspring. And this happens in a few places. And people say, well, that's, that's weird because there's no male. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it, you know, maybe it got pregnant or whatever crayfish do, the equivalent term, um, uh, in transit or in its, in its place of origin or at the shop where I bought it from or something like this. But, you know, um, anyway, they, 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 they observe this and they're a bit puzzled by this. And, but gradually they begin to realize that all the crayfish, even the offspring, are also female. And they're still having offspring. And they're saying to themselves, where are the males? You know, they're, they're all females. There are no males here. Uh, you know, some people's dream world, by the way. You know, you can have yeah. <laughs> without, without males involved. Anyway, they, um, they gradually begin to suspect that these creatures somehow spontaneously have become parthenogenetic. So they're, they're reproducing asexually without any sexual contact. They've basically become, they acquired the ability to clone themselves. It suggested to them that here was a way of understanding that old thorny question about the balance of forces between nature and nurture. You know, because we've, we've got half the problem contained. It's absolutely nailed down. They are genetically identical. So if we see differences in these creatures, well, it's got to be the other one, hasn't it? It's got to be the environmental cause in that case. So they got a few hold of these, these few of these things and they started putting them into, into tanks in the lab. Uh, but they also went a step further, and this is where it gets really interesting, because they also standardized their environments. So they made sure that the water every single creature was in was the same. They made sure that all their food was the same. They made sure that every single creature had more than enough to eat, so there needn't be any competition for food. They put quite a lot of them on their own, so there wasn't even any interaction they had the same person examine them on every occasion using the same variety of rubber gloves. You know, they, they tried basically to standardize everything they could think of, and make their environments as boringly uniform as, as imaginable. And this is Germany. They, you know, <laughs> they're good at that. Um, so um, what did they look like, these creatures, as they developed? Because now we have perfectly consistent genetics. They checked that. They didn't just assume it. We have, as far as humanly possible, a consistent environment. These are the big two causes, as far as we know, of everything. So, okay, the marmocrebs, you know where this is going. They're fantastically varied. There's a, you can take marmocrebs from the same batch of eggs, and one of them turns out 20 times the weight of another. The physical variety is just astonishing. They're genetically identical. Their environmental environments are identical. They're all fed to excess, no competition for food. One is 20 times the weight of another. The carapace on every single one of them, this, this shell, is, is, um, has a different pattern of markings. They have these little feeding parks around the front of the mouth. They have different numbers, different physical numbers. It's like having different numbers of teeth, you know, um, they, they're, so they're physically different. They're also behaviorally different. Some of them like a crowd, some of them are loners. You know, some of them are really gregarious. Um, some of them are dominant. When you bring them together, some of them turn out to be dominant, and some of them are, are, are kind of subservient. Some of them feed when they're laying, some of them don't. Uh, the, t the point in life when they start laying eggs is quite radically different. Their lifespans vary by a factor of three. You know, imagine that in human terms, you know, I mean, uh, where, where you're, you know, take triplets, genetically identical, uh, standardized environments, and imagine their lifespans varying by a factor of three as a norm. You know, I mean, th just the variety in these creatures was absolutely dumbfounding. And you say, okay, uh, once you've got over the shock, um, why? How, uh, what, what's going on? 
in order to produce this kind of variety when everything we know is the same. You know, we've got, you've got something the same clearly isn't in some way the same, but what is it that's different? And this is, this is where we come back to the original definition of the hidden half. You know, that all the time we're looking for the big regularities. And here are two of the most Herculean regularities we've ever come across, genetics and environment. And it's neither. <laughs>